Innovation distinguishes a leader from a follower. But innovation is facing a challenging time. Will it bend to geopolitics? Can it continue as an inspiring and disruptive force? Will it still find a way to improve the world? Do join me on Let Innovation Speak, World Insight Special on Summer Doubles 2019 only on CGTN. Hello and welcome to Let Innovation Speak, a special program of World Insight on Summer Doubles 2019. I'm Tian Wei. Geopolitics, many believe, is the elephant in the room at this year's Summer Davos. Whether innovation can still be shared and whether a new economic momentum be pursued, both have a lot to do with how that issue is being dealt with by the international community. On that, the business community does have a lot to say. On the sidelines of the Summer Davos 2019, I talked to Frank Ning, the chairman of Sinochem Group, a straight talker, certainly, who means the no words. Let's listen in. First question for you, latest development, China-U.S. Uh, trade negotiations at the G20 summit, the two sides agreed to restart the negotiation again. So what do you make of the potential? Uh, timetable, long term or short term? I think this uh, gives the market a strong signal. Dispute will continue, but there will not be a major war. Both side leaders understand where is the limit. So uh, I think it's a, it's, it's, it's a good gesture. Uh, I think this type of negotiation will continue for a long time, maybe. Uh, you reach agreement on this side, you, you, you want to change other conditions. I think it will continue. But uh, again, uh, a complete uh, major trading war has been avoided. I, we perceive this uh, message uh, like this. You, know. you seem to have a lot of optimism. The trading war started for many reasons. Today, I think when the, when the initial uh, kind of uh, uh, dispute started, the initial uh, uh, tariff started, uh, people feel uh, it's not really the material impact of the trade. It's very much the confidence, the trust. Uh, the investment, uh, the sentiment, everything changed. Yeah. Okay, and the trade war, to only the trade tariff only started for a few months. But uh, I think people try to avoid that. Uh, but uh, they, they still try to find a solution on that. I think it's good. Uh, I think they know where the limit is. Uh, it's not going to be a long fighting uh, on, on trade or technology or other things it's getting worse and worse. I think nobody, nobody will survive uh, or benefit from that. But what about the disruption to the global supply chain as we already observed some signs of it? Oh, business is not uh, uh, only passive. Business uh, is, uh, is also business is uh, adopting. But is it fair for businesses? Business has been globalized. Uh, business has been value chain uh, uh, integrated. But the government uh, are still separated. Uh, government has their own agenda politically. Uh, sometimes they take care of business, sometimes don't, they don't. Some they use business. Uh, so for whatever reason, for election, for other reasons. So business will have to find a way of, of them, themselves. Uh, I think usually business will find a way much better than people expected. How many people are moving back to the U.S.? Zero. So some people say that they're going to move to Vietnam. But uh, President Trump said that he's not happy with the people moving back, moving to Vietnam. But uh, I mean, the relocation of their uh, supply chain right. has not started yet. I mean, the worst thing was started, the people re, uh, uh, relocate their production base, uh, their, their, their technology base, uh, and, uh, so if that is the case, uh, if that really uh, happened, uh, so uh, the, the world would become two parts. I don't think people are stupid enough to do that. But Mr. Ning, what about subsidies? That, that's one of the big issues in the U.S.-China trade discussion. 
as far as we understand. Mm. And China's SOEs, according to the U.S. side at least, uh, has been receiving industrial subsidies. Well, of course, you could say the U.S. has been providing agricultural subsidies to its agricultural industry. I think there's no particular subsidy for SOE. What do you mean by no particular subsidy? Okay, when I was with Copco many years ago, Copco received some subsidy, some subsidy. On what? On corn ethanol fuel. Mm -hmm. You know, the ethanol fuel, use corn to produce ethanol add into uh, gasoline, their subsidy. Their subsidy not for the SOE, it's for the whole sector. Anybody who produces ethylene, you, you, you give, you, you're, you're given subsidy. That policy was out mainly for environmental purposes. Exactly. I mean, it's environmental, uh, it's, a, it's a protection of the farmer's uh, product price as a renewable energy, many reasons. So that shouldn't be an issue in the U.S.-China discussion when it comes you to trade. You can study that. You, you, you can re investigate that. What about WTO reforms? As we understand, uh, the reform is still ongoing in terms of discussion. I think we so welcome WTO reform if people follow or people uh, uh, recognize WTO rules. Today, uh, they do not want to recognize WTO rules at all. Do not reform. Doesn't matter reform or not reform. Uh, I think China will eventually be a totally open country, 100% open, zero tariff. Uh, when is that going to be? From an entrepreneur's perspective? This is sooner or later. What does that mean? It's sooner or later? There's a big difference between it's the more, two. You know, the world is flat and there's more competition. Okay, I mean, so you got more companies uh, compete and, and, and you get, a, you get a more imported goods, but you can export more too, but which means that you put a companies in a front way uh, to compete, uh, you know, uh, face to face. Mm -hmm. I mean, this, this, it will happen anyway. You know, we thought this can happen later, for a few years later. Now it's going to happen today. It's okay. Are you ready? Yes, you have to. Since the trade war started, how you and your colleagues have been preparing for this? Uh, for our, for new material, other things. Uh, for fiber, for anything that has compete. Maybe the Chinese company will transform a little bit, will, will, will be sort of, uh, 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 will be facing more severe competition. Uh, but uh, this is something you have to do. You want to compete, but others want to decouple. You probably don't even have the opportunity to compete. If anybody wants to decouple, uh, that's uh, they, their fault and that's their lose. You know, uh, this, is a, this is a market, uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is the only growth uh, place, and, uh, and the, the emerging market today, uh, you know, has been a half of the GDP of the world. Asia has been half of the GDP of the world, and uh, it's, uh, things have changed. You know, I mean, you can't use the sort of, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, traditional uh, mentality to think about the world economy. I mean, it's, it's, it's no growth, it's uh, relatively, uh, you know, uh, um, you know it's, uh, it's uh, stagnated for a while, politically, economically. Uh, but anyway, but people, business, I say, why biz business driven by growth, mm -hmm. by, by, by new market? This is the nature of capital. Otherwise, why business? Finalcam, the company you're running, yeah. certainly is an international company, even mm -hmm. though it is headquartered in China. Yep. If there were further turbulences in the trade, mm. which it's very likely, as you said, it's going to be a long-term discussion. Yeah, yeah. What does that mean for your international approach, particularly into the developed markets? The Chinese thought in the beginning, you know, I told you, that, I mean, they are welcome to invest. And they were told that. They invite us to go, you know, uh, and they give us incentive to go. Uh, you know, it's, uh, but okay, today if people change their mind, okay, we don't want you anymore, that's okay. You know, I mean, we don't have to acquire, we don't have to invest, you know, we can sell, we can, or we can trade, or we cannot trade, it's okay. So, uh, but uh, wh why I'm so confident? Because uh, I think uh, the domestic consumption is picking up, right. and China is growing, South East Asia is growing, 
uh, Russia and the, the, the Black Sea area is growing, Africa is growing, you know, there, there are a lot of places. You don't have to be there, you don't have to go there, I mean, so uh, to go to places you're, you're not welcome. You don't have to, to do that. It's also about the innovation, isn't it? It's about technologies as well. Oh, yeah. uh, on the one hand, people say, oh, China has very good you know, marketplace in a way, consumer market technological innovation. However, when it comes to industrial technological innovation, there still might be challenges for China if it is not about collaboration in the future anymore. China uh, must uh, cross or must fill that gap. Uh, because uh, uh, the industrial uh, industrialization history in China is still very short. Uh, I don't think Chinese can cover that in many areas uh, immediately. But uh, the reason I'm confident because uh, uh, because uh, I think China has been uh, China has passed this uh, first phase of industrialization. I think China accumulate all these uh, strengths, resources, and manpower to do more research, more technology-oriented investment, uh, to uh, be uh, more industrialized, uh, and, and uh, to be technology-wise uh, leading. Uh, it will happen. It is happening today. I anticipate. In the next 10 years, mm -hmm. you will see China will be a much more technology-driven country. That's likely to be a bit of a bigger threat to the United States. Then geopolitics could be even more complicated than what it is already. We do not intend to threat anybody. We just want to grow our economy. So what is happening to the Chinese entrepreneurship? I mean. At once, uh, you were saying the other day that you know people have a lot of respect for real estate developers because that's where the industry has earned much of the money. Yeah. But now people have much more respect for people like uh, Ren Zhengfei, yeah. for example, the founder of Huawei, who obviously has caught up in a crossfire of geopolitics between two countries. Mm -hmm. So, what do you think about what is the entrepreneurship now? What is the so-called business? spirit is about these days in China. You know, I, I think... Uh, is it about the fighting spirit you know, or you know, is it about I, I something else? I think the whole market economy, the commercial, uh, let's say, civilization in China is still very short. So companies, entrepreneurs, people are still learning, adjusting themselves. So inevitably, they started with uh, trade, with speculation, with short term, uh, it's kind of a uh, you know, quick money type of uh, uh, investment or, or business model. Today, I like it or not, or either it's because of the engine fee or otherwise, <laughs> but the thing is uh, people learn or people are kind of uh, believed they have to have a long-term strategy. They have to have a long-term planning mm -hmm. and uh, they have to have a technology-driven uh, our technology focused business model uh, to survive or to last for a uh, long uh, period. So it, it's, it's a natural transformation of a company uh, strategy and it's going uh, very strong. Mm -hmm. uh, so Ren Zhengfei is very much, uh, he got the first, first uh, move uh, type of uh, example yeah. and to, to show the world uh, he succeeded commercially uh, by, by building a great company, yeah. not a, by a short-term uh, speculation. is a leader from a follower. But innovation is facing a challenging time. Will it bend to geopolitics? Can it continue as an inspiring and disruptive force? Will it still find a way to improve the world? Do join me on Let Innovation Speak, World Insight Special on Summer Doubles 2019 only.
of CGTN. The capability to innovate for any economy has a lot to do with the ability in science and technology. But how is science and technology being harnessed in various economies? And what is the global governance rules regarding the development in this field? Can they be shared, the fruit of development of the latest innovation? On those questions, I asked the head of the Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution that established by the World Economic Forum. Let's take a look. So nice to hear that the innovation centers around the world are now in operation after quite some time of preparation. We've been live not that long. This is two years, three months, but we're running fast mm -hmm. because technology is moving rapidly and governments and businesses are trying to figure out how do we take advantage of all of that. But one of the things is people keep on asking, innovation, technology, for whom? And for what purpose? Yes, exactly. So we've seen it coming for hundreds of years, but now it's moving much, much faster and there's more happening. And people, governments, business, society, academia is uh, having a hard time in catching up. They operate in what we call the too late zone. By the time we react to something, the world has already moved on. Mm -hmm. And on the, for what purpose? We're focused on benefits to citizens and society. We want to make sure that the technology benefits everyone, not just a portion of the society, and not just one nation, but the rest of the world. And there are global commons that uh, countries and businesses can agree on, which is what we're seeing, which is a promising sign. You know, some believe there is an overwhelming national security issue. Others say, well, we want to make the most benefits out of all the latest uh, technological developments. So, yes, sure, but later, or in our term, only. Yes, I will be optimistic as you're provocative. <laughs> <laughs> because if you take an aging society, China will see that. And we're seeing that already in Japan. Four million people with dementia, declining population. And it will double in the next 10 to 20 years. It will cripple the Japanese society. I think China wouldn't want the same thing to happen to itself, but no single country has all the answers. And we need to find a way that these technological developments are properly governed, including data policy, ethical use of AI, proper data collection, and making sure that we all benefit from it. So China can learn from other countries, and other countries can learn from China, and it's in everybody's interest. If we don't collaborate, nobody will be able to solve it on their own. And that will be a situation that not everybody would be uh, comfortable in. Of course, national security and other uh, topics come up, but I think we can manage both. We can make sure that we collaborate to improve the lives of the citizens while protecting the national interests so they're not mutually exclusive. Now, here's the issue. When you have developing and emerging economies very much want to become the mainstream of the society moving forward, particularly in innovation, technological development, you also have some members of the earlier uh, developed economies reluctant, in a way, uh, to negotiate as a result of the change of the world. Uh, how would you be able to bring everybody together? Does it mean the newcomers have to make more compromise to the already existing, uh, shall we say, minds of innovation because otherwise it would not happen, the collaboration and cooperation. Is it going to be a fair share of collaboration and cooperation? I think as long as it's voluntary um, and people who want to collaborate, um, then I think we'll be in a good spot. I'll give you one example. If you look at drone regulation. Voluntary under what term? On the terms of the participating entities, businesses, governments. And I'll give you one example. If you look at drone regulation, Rwanda became the first country to successfully regulate the use of drones. We helped them do that in five months. Small country, Eastern Africa, not a big economic impact, but they became a role model for drone regulation. Now, Malawi, Tanzania, and Kenya is adopting it. Ghana adopted it. India is looking into using that. International Civil Aviation Organization is working with us to help figure that out. So does FAA. It started out of a small country now it's scaling worldwide. It's a beautiful example, but I have to remind you that geographically speaking and geopolitically speaking, some of those wonderful African countries compared to some of the other economies and countries are very different in nature. Well, the 
current model of international cooperation is operating in the too late zone. When you look for consensus, the days of consensus unfortunately are over. What we want today is move from consensus to collaboration. And this is what we're seeing in our network. We already have 27 governments who are collaborating with each other through a common purpose to improve the lives of their citizens. I could well see the challenges you are having in doing your job, but also the confidence that you have in making it happen. But Merez, what is that magical tool to make sure people understand consensus time, yes, have passed, but don't lose hope. We still got the opportunity for collaboration. I think it's concentrating on common purpose. If you talk to people on the street and say, would you like to have a better future for your children? And they will say, most likely, yes. If you're not living in a city and you're in the outside of a big city, you feel left out. It doesn't matter if, what country you're in. And would they be willing to participate? Do, you, do they want to do that? And do, they want to, do we want to create that opportunity for them to be inclusive? And if you look at the theme of our uh, meeting here, it's about leadership 4.0. It's economic leadership, it's industrial leadership, it's technology leadership, but it's responsible leadership as well. So when, you talk to, when we talk to all the stakeholders, we feel that there is a great deal of interest in agreeing on common purpose and alignment on execution. Now, World Economic Forum has been dealing with the business world for a long time. That's really one of the strong points of World Economic Forum. But there have been complaints in the world, at least you see the media reports, that some of the biggest international technological development uh, companies are not necessarily, quote unquote, socially responsible in how they process the data, how they use the technology, how they take advantage of the latest uh, technology that they have over the others. So what do you say about leadership in that regard? We're seeing a big change. And if you look at... Really? That big? Yes. And if you look at technology companies, I've been in Silicon Valley for 30 years. Now the employees of tech firms are demanding and keeping their uh, leaders on notice that they want to be ethical. It's not to shareholders, it's not to consumers, but it's their employees. And employees are the only assets they have. And if you look at plastics in the ocean, we have a Friends of o Ocean Action Initiative. And we have consumer packaged goods companies joining that, which in the past they may have been reluctant but now they're actively in participating in formulating a solution. And they are demanding the solution. They're demanding and they're becoming part of the solution because business is the muscles of the economy. Right? You can look at policymakers as the brains creating the policies, but if business is not involved, it's hard to achieve a solution. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing this pick up, especially in the last two years, that people, uh, the leaders around the world are looking at being not only successful financially, but also be responsible, and you can do both. However, it is very tricky, shall we say, from the other perspective. The business world have to deal with so much these days, particularly at a time of dramatic change, including geopolitics, which the business world is not equipped with to deal with, with all the tools. So how do you see it from the other side of the debate, which is how will, under the current circumstances, technology can still be nurtured by the business world with so much complexity? I think uh, having dialogue is essential. Having informal dialogue is essential. Having international dialogue in, is essential and impartial dialogue. And that's what the World Economic Forum has been doing for the last 50 years. And we're seeing more and more demand and desire from the global community. If you look at our presence in China, this is our 13th meeting. It's my personal 12th meeting in China. Congratulations. Thank you. And I love coming here <laughs> and learning. And we have 1,800 participants. 70% is from outside of China. So there is a need from the rest of the world to learn what's happening in China and for them to share. And also we see the same demand from within China as well. An interesting example since to talk about China is the mobile pay. Yes. Of course, uh, there was difficulty in other countries under different kind of cultural and economic and political conditions. Uh, Ch China has managed to be able to do that and do it in such a massive way. Right. If you look at it, whether you order food, you take a bicycle, you ride a taxi, you go on a plane or a train, anything. However, will this kind of special example be applicable to the other world, other parts of the world? Yeah. And meanwhile, will this be only a sporadic example 
or this will be the main trend of innovation? I'm sure you've been uh, putting a lot of thoughts into this. Yeah. You know, frictionless participation in economy is key, and inclusive growth is key. And technologies like mobile pay, being able to scan a QR code and pay for anything, even the beggars on the street I saw with <laughs> QR codes, <laughs> Which it is, was the funnest part of it. Which is amazing, right? And which means they must have a smartphone. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And, and it's again frictionless, it's inclusive. It makes total sense. The key thing is how do we create a cross-border uh, system where these payments happen across the border? Imagine a future. Somebody living in central China comes up with a product. He or she can design it using design software, puts it into a global marketplace, and somebody downloads it in anywhere in the world, goes to a 3D printer through 3D printed. This is going to happen. We have the technology, but we need to create the international norms to make it happen. Make sure that it's authentic, taxation is done, regulation uh, is done, and also it allows people around the world to participate. So you don't have to be in a massive big city. These are the topics that we're focused on. And if we can pull it off, it lifts everybody up. But timing is important, isn't yes. it, Maraz? Yes. Technology is so fast. We know there are so many technologies already available. It's only about how we apply it. And there are so much difficulties in applying it. It is, and that's why we set up the Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution Network uh, to make sure that we accelerate the technology governance. Mm -hmm. And so far, we're uh, excited about the potential and the achievements. Mm -hmm. Maraz, since you talk about innovation, there are so many different areas of innovation as we speak. There's probably something already revolutionary happening while we are talking to each other. So, out of the, oh, it's like a, a small girl coming into a candy shop. You know, which area shall we choose and where to focus on? What do you think? I think innovation happen. We cannot regulate innovation. Uh, we should just let innovation happen and let the system pick up who's successful, who's not. Because if you try to regulate, we're trying to predict the future, which we can no longer do. And if you look at what happened in artificial intelligence, three guys in London mastered a game called Ego, the Go. And uh, it happened 10 to 20 years ahead of expert expectations when they did it in March 2016. Mm -hmm. And in June 2016, we had Lee Sedol and Demis Asabis, yes. the co-founder here in China at the annual meeting of new champions talking about man versus machine. So this is again where the world converges on right. to see what the future is about. At that time people were still saying, oh, is it possible? But now you look at it, yeah. everything's happening. Exactly. And that was again a pivotal moment, but it happened 20 years ahead of expert opinion. So innovation will happen and it's up to us as a global community to make sure that it benefits the broader society. Being a leader of innovation does not necessarily matter much with the size of the economy, but many argue it has a lot to do with the quality of talents as well as the international cooperation economies manage to have. The Prime Minister of Georgia has pondered on the matter a lot. In an exclusive interview, he told us that his government spends 25% of the national budget on education. Take a look. Mr. Prime Minister, what a pleasure to see you at the World Economic Forum. It's my pleasure to be in your program. And congratulations for your link with the West. Thank you, thank you. And I would like to thank Prime Minister Lee for inviting me here in Dalian. Mm -hmm. Mr. Prime Minister, there were, it, was wi it is widely believed, Mr. Prime Minister, that the technological development and business community cooperation have exceeded much beyond the development of politics and the geopolitics these days in the world. And therefore, politicians have a much bigger responsibility these world to catch up and also bring all your pals to catch up. Now, Mr. Prime Minister, what do you make of that belief these days, widely you heard here at the World Economic Forum, how to catch up? how to make sure this is sound policy and not policy for elections? Well, um, the major topic of the World Economic Forum here in Italian is, of course, the fourth industrial revolution. And, and, yes, yeah. and so from my perspective, it will happen sooner than some experts 
might have predicted. And of course we have to prepare our societies for the big changes because the big changes will eventually happen. Therefore the human capital development is a major priority of my government and this was the major reason why we initiated the new legislation according to which we will invest 6% of our GDP which is 25% of our budget annually in education in human capital, capital building process in Georgia to make Georgia more competitive in the 21st century. Was it easy to get this done? Well, 25%? Yeah, we are talking to your peers, you know, 25%? It's not easy because it's a quarter of the budget so, yeah. so you, you should have a very very uh, serious uh, arguments to do that. But I, I, I believe that that's the only right way to proceed for the countries uh, like Georgia. So I'm sure that this reform will help us to increase the competitiveness of my country and of course to also provide the new opportunities for the international investors to, do the, to make the investments in Georgia. As you know, we are number six in terms of doing business. Uh, and that's a great achievement. We are very proud of it. We are number three in terms of low taxes uh, in, the, in the world uh, and with the investments that we are making in infrastructure and in human capital development so we'll be able to increase the competitiveness of Georgia significantly. I also would like to, uh, to inform your audience that we are very happy to see the trends that number of Chinese companies doing, in business, doing business in Georgia is growing and one of the last investments uh, the, um, uh, was from, from the famous car producer Chang'an so yeah. they, they will be building a new factory of, for electric cars in Georgia so I encourage Chinese companies to, to come to Georgia and then make investments. The Chinese Premier Li Keqiang in the meeting with you he was talking about treating Georgia uh, on an equal footing and in a, with mutual respect and a win-win. What is that win-win to you? Well, um, when we are talking about international politics, we have the common understanding about the very important issues like one China policy. Uh, we also two years ago signed a free trade agreement and which take the economic cooperation between two countries to another level and we are very happy to see that the trade is growing, that number of Chinese companies doing business in Georgia is growing. And now we have to be more result oriented in other dimensions. For example, Georgia is becoming uh, as a major tourist destination. This year we'll be hosting more than 9 million visitors so we would like to see more tourists coming from China to Georgia. Mm. However, I understand, Mr. Prime Minister, you've been working very hard around the world trying to establish free trade agreement with various economies, including with the United States, for example. Uh, so how is that multilateral approach for you? How to balance in a way, uh, in a way that would help Georgia in a sustainable development pattern? Well, uh, the major goal that we have is to integrate Georgia and the global economy in the most efficient way possible. We are an open economy, so we are located at the crossroads of civilizations and we are the gateway for eight landlord countries. So basically we are the natural candidate to become a regional hub for international business. So uh, it's an it's a individual and sovereign uh, decision of any nation how it will be integrated in the global economy. So what's your decision? Well, of course our decision is to have uh, a very open and liberal economy, to have free trade agreements with all major economies to give the platform to the international business, to the big corporations all around the world to do the business in our part of the world. That's how we see the role of Georgia. There are a lot of cooperation opportunities, as you mentioned, Mr. Prime Minister. You were in discussion with the Chinese uh, Premier about them. One of them is about the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, now, the second Belt and Road uh, Summit was already held uh, in China. But the question really is how to translate this concept into more concrete projects. Well, at the same time, make sure these projects will really benefit the people in which the projects are well, at the same time, make sure it's a win-win situation. 
or win-win-win situation, whoever is participating. So Mr. Prime Minister, your thought about from words into action, from action alone to best practice? Thank you for the question. Well, Georgia was uh, one of the first countries that joined President Xi's um, Belt and Road yes. Initiative. And um, basically due to the geographical location, we, we play a very important role in this uh, concept. And um, when we are talking about connectivity, some people mainly think about infrastructure connectivity. Mm -hmm. But I think that first of all we should be focused on connectivity among people. Mm -hmm. yeah, that would drive also the economic cooperation uh, so, and business cooperation. Uh, but of course infrastructure connectivity is uh, very important. For example, Georgia is a gateway for eight landlocked countries and uh, we should support these nations to unlock the economic value that uh, they have. So from our perspective, of course, um, it will create a very important synergy among nations. Finally, before we go, we are talking at a time when the G20 summit just concluded and they also have a declaration which is to be congratulated but people are still uncertain about the future not only long term but even short term so Mr. Prime Minister as a political leader yourself as one who wants to lead the country toward innovation and change our fate what, need, what do you need to balance at a time of uncertainty Mr. Prime Minister the outcome of G20 was a very positive signal to the international markets you have. Including the bilateral between China and the United States, of course. Yes, and, and in, in all other uh, dimensions as well. Uh, and I think that also the outcome of World Economic Forum will be a, another great and uh, positive signal. So uh, we are looking for more engagement. So we should be more engaged so we should try to make uh, our policies more sustainable so I'm a person who believes in sustainable mm -hmm. development uh, and uh, what we are trying to achieve on the national level of course the the best benchmark would be to have the same approach when it comes to the international uh, uh, cooperation so I believe in sustainable development and I, I believe in inclusive growth. So I think that these are the values that unite all of us. Maybe we will have some, uh, dif some different positions on other uh, issues, but when it comes to sustainable development and when it comes to inclusive growth, I think these are the topics that unite all of us. Mr. Prime Minister, what a pleasure seeing you at the World Economic Forum here in Dalian. All the best. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. With that, we are coming to the end of Let Innovation Speak, a special edition of World Insight at the Summer Davos this year. Tomorrow, we are going to bring you a special panel on the future of Belt and Road Initiative. See you then. I'm Tian Wei on behalf of my team in Dalian and in Beijing. Bye for now.